What's going on, y'all? I am Tobias Rose, the principal and the creative director here at this place called Complex Creative. And right now, you're locked into conversations. And this is the podcast and video series that we do whenever the hell we want to do it. I tell people that we do it on a weekly basis, but that's not true. I tell people we do it on a monthly basis, but that's not true either. We actually do this whenever we want. So thank you for locking in with us today. Um, I want to welcome a special guest to the studio. This is a friend. This is someone that I've served on, on the board together with. Uh, we've gotten in trouble. We've, uh, in a good way, good trouble, good things. And so this is a person who has shown me the importance of an airport. Uh, I don't think that people do enough to understand just how important it is to our economic development and to our economy, our local economies. But the airport, if you really think about it, that's the epicenter. That's how you get things in and get things out. That's how you fly to other places and make money. That's how you fly to places and you give people money. Um, actually, I don't want to do that. But that's how it happens. That's commerce. And so what better person to talk to than the CEO of the airport? We've been through a lot this year. And so we need to know how the airport was able to make people fly again. So I brought my friend, Michael Landon. Michael, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I should have probably had some of that Red Bull before we started. We got, we got a lot of energy behind this. We got all kind of things you can drink here. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you're talking. I'm going to go get a beverage then. I could hook you up if you want something. <laughs> so, so you're the CEO of the airport. Yes. Can you talk to me a bit about what that means? What does it mean that you're the CEO? You know, it's a great job. Mm -hmm. You know, for the airport, the airport is kind of the economic engine for the region. That's right. You think about it, when you start attracting companies like an Apple or Google to your local community, those are companies that don't just sell products and services within our local community or local region or the state. They sell those products and services literally all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so we provide that connectivity. As I kind of share with people, if you think about the evolution of transportation, the evolution of cities, economic growth, you think about the stagecoach. Let's go all the way back to the stagecoach, right? Yeah, Wells Fargo. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Wherever Wells Fargo stopped, that's kind of where the city was. Yeah. Then you move on to kind of the interstate where you had an off-ramp, you had a city, you had economic growth. And today it's about a vibrant airport because again, companies don't just sell products in their local market they sell in the United States and they sell stuff worldwide mm -hmm. and the only way you can reach that is by going through an airport so it's important for overall economic growth but it's also important for people just you know communicating and engaging with each other mm -hmm. think about your grandparents you get to go see your grandparents your parents your loved ones That's you right. get to go see great places and have vacations or even have people come here and enjoy what we all the great things we have in our local community mm -hmm. So economic engine, but also connects people to places and people that, that matter to in, in, in your life. So with you being in that role, like that's, that's super important. Um, do you ever feel like, well, I know you probably did at one point, we'll get in a minute, but do you ever feel like, man, this is a lot. You know, uh, I have to make sure the region is connected to other regions. Is there ever a feeling of, you know, responsibility in a sense of, man, this is hard. You know, I've got a great team of people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really do a lot of the heavy lifting. Firefighters, police officers, plumbers, electricians, yeah. they keep that airport going. Yeah. We've got an executive team that really lays out a good plan for the organization and a board that's engaged that represents this community, mm -hmm. and it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you try to pick out things in your life you love to do, and if you do that, it's no longer considered a job. Right. For me, it's not really a job. It's what I enjoy doing on a day-to-day -day basis and connecting people like yourself and the community as large Mm -hmm. understanding why this airport is so important because it helps you, yeah. helps your business, but also helps people in our local community have a better quality of life. You know, the thing that I've always recognized about you that I appreciate is that you really love this stuff. I do. You really do. Like when we yeah. talk about airport, when we talk about getting people in the air, your eyes light up. Yes. I've seen it happen. <laughs> How did you get here? Like, how did you get to this point? I know you weren't born a CEO. Well, some people might say that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did you get to this point? You know, it's an interesting career, and I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit about kind of where I was born and yeah. kind of a little bit of that path give real all, quickly. Me, tell me all of it. Born in Bermuda, if you can imagine that. What? Born in Bermuda, yeah. You're Caribbean? Yeah. So my dad was in the Air Force at the time, and so Don't. my brother and sister were born in Fairbanks, Alaska. So to give you the extreme, but we lived literally all over this country. Wow. So. Bermuda, Cheyenne, Wyoming, Denver, Colorado, Washington, D.C., Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, Daytona Beach, Sarasota, Daytona, Chicago, Oak Ridge, Knoxville, Phoenix, 
Chattanooga here. You lived in all those places? All those places. Some as a kid growing up with my parents, some married my wife. We've been married 30 plus years, uh, moving around. And some of it's part of this kind of career. So yeah. if you want to move up in the industry for airport, you've got to be willing to kind of move around and do those things. Amazing. It's a funny story. When I graduated from school, I graduated from a school called Embry-Riddle Aeronautic University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Wow. And my wife and I knew that we wanted to live, guess where? Not right here in this great state. Oh, come on, man. Are you yes. serious? Seriously. And we actually took a car ride, and we took a car ride from the western portion of the state to the eastern port of the state, looking for places that, you know, I might be able to get a job actually flying, because I was initially going to be a pilot, and really working in an airport was really not in the mix at the end of the day. We traveled all over the state, never found an opportunity. Matter of fact, at RDU, uh, through my career, when I was kind of entering this industry, I probably applied to at least six or seven different positions oh, that I never got hired for. But the final position that I got was the CEO here. After multiple years of training, education, work experience, I finally got where I really wanted to be. And people really, I mean, I've lived lots of places, okay? Yeah. They really don't understand the quality of life and the things you have here. I mean, we have a very diverse economy, a very diverse population of people. Yeah. That is a very good thing for our community. It's great quality of life. I mean, weather, really not that bad. Yeah. You know, I'm two hours from the beach, three hours from the mountains. On the, on the airport, I can get literally anywhere in the world that I want to go. Mm -hmm. Good paying jobs for our citizens, great opportunities for our children. When we moved here, we moved here, I had uh, two uh, teenage daughters. One that was going to go into 11th grade and the other one's going to go into 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And they wound up not only going to colleges here, NC State, Wolfpack, don't know if you're a Wolfpack fan. No, okay. I teach there sometimes. I love, don't get me wrong, I love my Wolfpack. <laughs> okay. I love the School of Design at NC State. Um, but I, I got to be real with you. When, when you grow up in North Carolina, you got to take a side. You got to take a side? Duke or UNC. And I was raised UNC. UNC? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Tar Heel fan. So. Okay. Well, yeah. we won't hold that. <laughs> Mother daughter went to UNC Greensboro. Okay. And both of them have gotten good paying jobs right here in the local community. Yeah. And it's because there's great opportunities here for our children. Agreed. And a lot of places across the country, you don't have that opportunity for your children. Uh, and I think that's a, a great thing for all of us that live here and call this home. So tell me a bit about your, your past, if you can, because sure. I, I know for some of us we it's have classified, speckled. classified, but we'll yeah, try yeah. to do the best we can. Well, and some speckled past. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, tell me about you know, some of the, the other jobs, because I'm, in my head I'm trying to figure out right. what is the blueprint. Like, if I want to grow, well, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. grow up to be like you, because I'm, I'm already in the design. But if I was younger and I wanted to grow up to be uh, a CEO of an airport, what kind of jobs would, would I take on? What kind of jobs did you take on? Because I know it's always going to be a different path for everyone. Yeah, you know, it really is. When I talk to my peers across the country, there was no set pattern. Yeah. There were some fundamental things that people did along the way, but there wasn't a set pattern. You know, for me, I graduated from a college in aviation. I started flight instructing. I was a flight instructor, started to fly, started to build hours. At the time I kind of came out of that industry or came out of college, there was a lot of mergers and acquisitions that were occurring within the, within the industry, mm -hmm. but there weren't a lot of opportunities. And so could never quite get my footing in that space. Yeah. Uh, my wife unfortunately wound up getting sick. We had to relocate to Chicago and moved in with her parents, mm -hmm. try to help her along and you know, just did not have the income to make that. And you know, you talk, people talk about struggles. There yeah. was a struggle there at the very beginning to kind of work my way through it. I wound up working at a video store as an assistant manager as I came out of college just because her health conditions were, were, were pretty bad. She's worked her way through that and mm -hmm. surprisingly enough, she stick with me, which is even more surprising after recovering from that. But you know, from there I wound up, um, my dad had called me, he'd been in the military and he suggested that I come try to try out for the Tennessee Air National Guard. They're a, an air refueling tanker base that's in Knoxville, Tennessee. And at the time when I went down there, I talked to the commander, they didn't have any openings for flight slots. They didn't have any openings for uh, pilot's positions or officer positions. They said, you know what, you can try this, you can join the enlisted ranks. Mm -hmm. Typically enlisted ranks, you know, college educated kid, right. mm, is that really a path you want to take? But it potentially was going to lead to a flight slot. Went off to boot camp, uh, went off to tech school, came back, and during that time it was Desert Storm, Desert Shield was going on. Yep, war was going on. By the you time I got that? back, the war was over by the time I made it back. Okay. Okay. So the war is over, and at that point in time, they had so many pilots, I basically timed out. Because once you reach 26 yeah. and a half, you've got to be in pilot candidate school, and they just didn't have the slots available. So I was, you know, basically in the enlisted ranks, living in uh, eastern Tennessee, and I really kind of pivoted a little bit. 
and went to work in the environmental consulting business. So the Department of Energy, they have um, a couple plants, what they call uh, K25, Y12. Y12 was a weapons production plant. Mm -hmm. So the material that we used to bomb Japan, that came out of Y12. What? And as part of that, this was now a cleanup program. They were spending a half a billion dollars a year cleaning up all the environmental insult that occurred. And so I wound up working as a project manager, working on helping us to do site investigations at radioactive and hazardous waste sites. You know, I did that for a while, but you know, as you're starting to think about having children and working in highly radioactive, heavy wow. metals, yeah. wife said, there's gotta be a different career path. And it was interesting what I did is I reached out to the airport manager at McGee Tyson, the commercial service airport, and I said, how do you get into this business? I graduated from a college that was aviation based. I'm a, a flight instructor, a pilot. You know, I've got management experience. I've got all the elements to be successful within this industry, but no time in service, time in grade is what we kind of call it. Hadn't worked at an airport. And so he thought about that a little bit and he said, hmm, let me think about that and I'll call you back in about two weeks. Came back two weeks later and they had a project that they were working on that they were going to hire a consultant to work on. They said, look, you get, I was working on my graduate research project. So if you want to use this as your graduate research project and do the research, find, uh, develop the report and present it back to our leadership, you can take it on. I'm okay. not going to pay anything for it, but you can take it on. So I said, guess what? I'll go ahead and I'll take that on. Took that on, did a great job, gave them what they wanted, didn't have to pay for consultant. They didn't get the answer they wanted, but that was the answer that the report actually produced at the end of the day. And I asked him, I said, well, do you have any job openings? He said, no, but I have a recommendation for you. Recommendation is, why don't you go take an intern position at one of three places, Philadelphia, San Francisco, or Phoenix. These are professional, 24 months in duration, they pay you a salary, but you get an opportunity to learn everything about Airport Management 101, and you're going to be able to apply all your experience, plus this internship, will lead you the ability to catapult your career. So I came home to my wife. We now have two infants. We got two car payments, a mortgage payment, and infants. And I told my wife, I said, have I got a plan for you? Ooh, ooh. She goes, what's that? And I said, I think I want to go explore this intern. She goes, well, go explore it. So I went and explored it. She and said, okay. Go, go explore. Go explore. Don't commit yet. Let's oh, explore. Oh, okay. She said, yeah, you Let's go explore. Let's explore. <laughs> yeah. So wound up uh, applying for Phoenix because they had an opening, yeah. got an interview. They called me back and said, you've got the job. So I went to my wife and I said, if I got a deal for you, I'm gonna take about a 50% cut in pay. There's no moving, no relocation expenses. You're gonna be on your own with two infants and I need to leave in about three weeks to go take this new job. Wow. And she said, there's only one question I've got for you. I said, what's that? She goes, what is it gonna to lead to? Okay. And I said, what's well, gonna to lead to? Because again, it's always the end. If you're in struggles at the very beginning, you put a plan together to work right. yourself through it, but there is a rainbow at the very end and we're kind of at the rainbow. 30 years ago, that looked a lot different. And I told her, I said, I know the individuals that are in the leadership out there. They've been in the business 35 to 40 years, and they, this is their program. They've embraced the program, and they're going to help mentor me, and I'm going to take a risk. Mm -hmm. She said, okay, let's do it. And literally two weeks later, all I had is a Jeep, I had a futon, I had school books because I was going to graduate school, and I had my clothes. And I drove out to a place that I'd never, never met anybody before, rented a one-bedroom in a house, and that's all I had, no furniture whatsoever. Well, the important thing is you had a Jeep. That's all I had. a Jeep, matters. that's right. <laughs> I could get Jeep out of there if I had to. <laughs> right, you can get out of anything yeah. with a Jeep. That is, that's amazing. So, all right, tell me more. What else happened? Because this is a crazy story. So I wound up you know, being there for, gosh, about 18 months. The great thing that happened is uh, um, my brother and my mother, uh, mother went to graduate school at University of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Guess who was at the national championship in Phoenix, Arizona when I was out there? Ooh. UT versus Florida State. So my dad didn't have tickets, but friends of his did. He came out there with 12 tickets to go to the national championship game. They were absolutely a nosebleed section. And of course, my wife, she, um, she can negotiate with anybody. We were driving by a bar in downtown Tempe, and she said, give me those 12 tickets. She said, stop the car. My dad stopped the car. She walked out into a bar. 10 minutes later, she walked back out. She had four tickets, 50-yard line, upper deck. She sold the 12 and bought four more. So we got four tickets, 50-yard line. We are in the upper deck of Florida State, though, so that wasn't so great. No. Uh, but got to see uh, University of Tennessee win a national championship when we were in, in uh, Phoenix. But that's the great experience about aviation is that you get to experience all these things, all these great people from around the world, whether it's sports figure or, you know, president. Mm -hmm. You get to have the exposure to those folks. And then fast forward to the end of 18 months, I knew my contract was going to be ended at 24 months. I just started to look across the country. 
And it just so happens we came back to Chattanooga, Tennessee. We didn't know if we were going to go to Spokane, Washington. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. Uh, because as my wife always says, you know, where the home is is where both of us are going to be. Right. It's not the physical structure you live in. That's it's right. where you're with your people. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to do that. Did that for about 12 years and uh, had a, a consultant who specializes in recruiting for these types of positions for CEOs. And I've been on their radar for a long time because as jobs come up that are a little bit larger in size, oh, they said, Washington. you might fit, you might fit. And I told them some of my criteria is once my kids get two daughters, going to school, take them out of high school, worst thing you can possibly do. Don't want to take them out till they graduate and go to college. And so they showed up at my doorstep and said, we don't think you can pass this opportunity up. And I said, what is it? I said, it's already you. And so I went to my wife and I said, hey, she said, let me guess, you want to go look? I said, absolutely, we're going to go look. So went and looked, went through the kind of the preliminary interview process and came back to talk to the children. I said, I think this could get serious quickly. So let's walk through what this looks like and what it would look like for you. One of them, I was going to let, you know, you both get to finish the school year, but you'd have to move. And where are you? And both of them said, we can do it. We're going to have to do it at college. Yeah. So why don't we do it now? So if it fits for you, it'll fit for us at the end of the day. And wow. so then I went through the interview process. Next thing I know, they called me and said, would you like to come work at RDU? And I said, been thinking about coming to North Carolina my entire life. Absolutely. I'll do it. And how long have you been the CEO? November 11th will be 10 years. Oh, come on. Can you believe that? I want to just clap. That is that's amazing. a great story, that's isn't it? That's an amazing story. Feast of famine overnight. I didn't Not know really. that that's how it went down. That's yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've known you for a minute, but I didn't know that that's how you got here. Yeah, great support from my wife. She really did a lot of the heavy lifting for the children and yeah. gave me the opportunity to pursue what I wanted to pursue. But um, uh, as I told my wife, I think everything worked out at the end. And, Kids are close by. My kids live five to seven miles away from me, and one's gotten married, got a new baby on the way, and another yeah, one's got a serious boyfriend. So, I mean, life is really good. You that know, incredible. even beyond what the airport's like, life in general is good. So, yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about the airport. So you're the CEO now. Sure. You've been in the game ten years, ten plus years, and we get to. Let's see, 10 years, let me count back. So that means you got here around what, 2010, 2011? 2011. 2011. 2011. Yep. All right, so you missed the whole 2007 situation. Yeah, a little bit of downturn that occurred across this country. A little bit of a little hit bit. to the economy. A little bit. I'm actually, I'm actually glad that I went through that as a, a businessman because right. when this happened, I knew what to do. Yeah. I had already gone through it in 07, so I said, okay, let's do kind of what we did, but let's make some changes. So I knew right. how to handle it. Um, now, for you, that's different, right? Because this is an entire airport. I mean, Delta, Delta, Air <laughs> American Airlines, Southwest. Right. It goes on and goes on, and that's not even to mention all the private, you know, private uh, corporate jets. Corporate, yeah, the yeah, corporate jets absolutely. and things like that. But we're we're all in lockdown now. No one's flying anymore. Yeah, you're running an airport that you can't really run because <laughs> no one's flying. But sitting home on their couches. Right, they're sitting at home. Yeah. So, so tell me about March, February, yeah. March. I want to talk to you about February, March, and April. Most of the time I ask people about just March, but for you, yeah, yeah. there was a process. There were some things that happened. Yeah. First, let's talk a little bit about the industry as a whole. So, Please. you know, this industry is not, this is not the first shock they've ever had. So 2007, 2009 timeframe, you had a major recession that went into play. You had 9-11, Gulf Wars, pandemic, SARS. I can list about 20 different things that have in this industry. I don't know if you as a kid, you had one of those little bouncy things that would stand up, had sand at the bottom, you'd punch it oh, in yeah. the nose, it's you'd come back up. Yeah. That's kind of our industry. You punch us in the nose, we fall down, we pop right back up. It's such an optimist. Sometimes slower, sometimes faster. Okay. For example, 9-11, we grounded airplanes for a couple days and got back up in the air. The recovery probably took about five to six years to recover to where we were prior to 9-11. From just a few days? Yeah, just a few days. It had significant uh, impact in people's travel experience experience and where they were going to go, but it took several years for us to recover. If you think of the 2007 to 2009, we only dropped by about 11% at RDU, but that took about almost seven years to recover. So you look at this and you look at this pandemic and say, is it worse uh, than what we saw in these other two events? And some economists said, if you combine those two events together, probably for our industry, it's probably a combination of those two things together. So let's go back to February of 2020. We were rocking and rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about adding seven to nine additional gates over at Terminal One. 
talking about a 19 gate expansion over at Terminal 2 I and mean, we were blowing and going. We were about ready to go before the Board of Directors in March for that nine gate expansion. Uh, we had submitted to the Board of Directors about a $300 million program for the year, our entire budget. And uh, we started to see uh, some rumblings across the country that, hey, we're concerned about international customers coming into the United States yeah. that could bring COVID into our uh, community. And so they started to have what they call funnel airports. There's about 11 different funnel airports that we had. And those funnel airports were supposed to capture these people. So what did we think would work? Ah, let's do a temperature check and we'll do a little bit of a medical screening and we'll be able to catch this. Okay. Well, what you probably didn't know is we actually had an individual that transferred from China through JFK, no symptoms whatsoever, in route from there to here, guess what? Symptoms flare up. We're now in February, so we're now starting to experience at RDU. Person lands, goes to the bathroom, gets sick, calls us. I'm sick, I don't know what to do. When you start talking to the health departments of the local area, they don't know what to do. They're, they're reaching out to CDC. We're having conversations with all these folks trying to figure out. The great thing is the great resources we have here, people don't even understand the medical expertise, world-renowned doctors and surgeons we have right here in our community. If you're gonna get sick, get sick right here. Right. This is the best place to get sick. And we called upon those folks, said, hey, what, do you, well, what should we do? And they rallied the troops and wound up, I think it was the Duke um, uh, folks wound up coming out getting the individual, wound up being a student, I think from Duke University, and wound up uh, taking care of the individual. I'm not sure what hospital they went to. That was kind of the end of it. Yeah. Well, the next part was, well, everybody was concerned about surface contamination. If, if you touch anything, you're gonna die. We, we really find out at the end of the day, that's not how that was being transmitted. But at the time, we didn't know. And so as we talked to everybody, nobody seemed to know how to explain to us to really clean up the bathroom, clean up the whole room area. How do we do this? And I remember we had a hazmat consultant that we use for general hazmat cleanups so if you have an oil spill or something like that. So we called them in and said, hey, what do you recommend? And I remember when we were sitting in that meeting in February, he said, well, this is what we're going to do. You remember the moon suits that they had when you landed on, on, on the moon? We saw people land on the moon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we want to put people. We want to put two people in that. What? Full SCBA. And we want to walk down the concourse where we have customers and we want to clean this up. No, because I'm going to think as a customer that I need to be wearing what they're wearing. Exactly. <laughs> and I said, don't you think that's a little bit overkill at the end of the day? Yes. And as we kind of kept talking with CDC, it says, no, that's really not what you need to do. You know, it's really that airborne piece. We just don't think it's going to be a factor. Put on a, what they call a Tyvek suit, you know, make sure you have your, your hands and gloves and let's go and use a disinfectant, a bleach water solution. We can clean that whole area and make it safe for everybody. And that's exactly what we wind up doing. But it just goes to show you, we really didn't know what to do at that time. Yeah. We advanced into March and about March 3rd, we had just restructured some long-term debt saved ourselves almost $90 million. Donna Silver, who is no longer my chief financial officer, she was instrumental in actually getting that done. Got that cleared on March 3rd. By March 9th, we were in a free fall, literally in a free fall for losing our customers. And as a CEO, you're kind of looking at that and saying, you know, how deep do you fall? Yeah. How deep do you fall? 50%, maybe that's where we wind up landing is 50% and that's rock bottom. We blew through 50% and we're just screaming to the bottom. By the time we reached around April 9th, we had lost about 96% of our customers. So if you can imagine in February, standing in this terminal, looking down Concourse 2, wherever I looked, masses of people, yeah. not enough room for everybody, lines coming out of the checkpoint. Then I go to April and I'm standing in that same Concourse and I'll be lucky if I see one person in that terminal, lucky yeah. if I see one person. And not really knowing where we were gonna wind up going. In April of 2020, worldwide, we had 65% of all commercial airlines sitting on the ground at the exact same time, not flying, carrying customers. That has never happened in the entire world. So you're starting to enter April to say, wow, this recovery could be longer. Yeah. What everybody said is, oh, this is a V recovery. This is gonna, we're gonna recover pretty quickly. And I thought it was kind of funny. I can only imagine if you were sitting in the boardroom for CDC trying to make these decisions, very difficult decisions, by the way, but it's kind of comical to me that first, you know, wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Then it was, no, don't wear a mask. No, no, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And I think they finally got to the point, well, we don't know what to do. Tell you what, let's tell them to all go home. And that's what they did. They said, why don't you all go home? So we sent everybody home and it literally just kind of shut our system down. 
And that system, if you think about all the businesses that are there, not just the big boys, the airlines, but we have small businesses that are there as well that run concessions. That was very painful. And to lose all those customers, you're bleeding cash at a rate that is unsustainable. Yeah. We had about eight different concepts that just literally went under, couldn't afford it. Taxi cabs just disappeared. Uber and Lyft just disappeared. Companies just disappeared from the airport because there weren't any customers. And now what you're looking at is preserving cash. Because unlike a private company, what did all the private companies do in the March timeframe and the February timeframe? They went to their lending institutions and drew down all liquidity they possibly could right. to cash flow their operations. As a governmental entity, I don't have the ability to do that. I have no taxing authority, and I rely 100% on what my reserves are. So I'm sitting on $300 million of reserves, and my program for the year is $300 million. So with no income coming in, T minus 12 months, I would be done. In two weeks, wow. we took a $300 million program that the board approved, and we cut it by $150 million. It went into survival mode, literally survival mode. And so what does survival mode look like for an airport? It means literally every labor contract you've got, janitors, landscapers, you know, mechanical stuff, yeah. all that got shut down. Well, you still have to take care of the airport. So who takes care of the airport? I'll give you an example, my C-suite, all those nice plants like what you have in this facility, all those plants in the terminals, those have to be watered. Yeah. You know who is watering the plants? You're looking at the green thumb. <laughs> I'm out there watering plants. Some of my staff is out there pushing lawnmowers, yeah. running weed whackers, doing whatever they possibly could to basically survive and keep the airport up and running. And really what I did is I knew that I had to get the attention of the staff off the pandemic and get it transferred to another priority. And so I developed a program called Operation Clean Sweep. And Operation Clean Sweep was really looking at the facilities and say, hey, isn't there an ability to paint things, touch things up, clean things up, things we've never had time to do when you got 15 million people running through your facility? Right, Don't have right. time to do that. Mm -hmm. Policies and procedures, improving the accounting uh, policies and procedures. There's a bunch of administrative things we could do as well. And we develop a list of priorities that says we're going to reallocate all those resources that are not efficient and effective at this point, and we're going to give them something to work on, something of value to the organization, something valuable to our community, mm -hmm. and we're going to put them to work and we didn't lay off one person not one person got laid off and we fought through that entire piece we wound up because we have a very nice uncle in washington dc you know sam i don't know if you've ever met him before me and sam we we have a, a, a different relationship. relationship yeah it's, it's different april 16th 15th time sometimes frame. we good sometimes <laughs> not so good you know, yeah around <laughs> april we, we just don't like to talk don't, don't get like along very well yeah. yeah he just takes too much <laughs> so that was something that the federal government you know recognized for airports and airlines they provided some cash injection to us nice. and i'll be honest without that it would have been very difficult we got about $50 million that paid for our debt service. Uh, we were on the verge of default of our, our bonds. Uh, our bonds, uh, there's a calculation that, you know, we have to generate our own income. We can't use reserves, and without it, you're really defaulting on yeah, those you bonds. Even, you can't even, you don't have income. You don't. <laughs> so. so you have to have positive cash flow. Without positive cash flow, they look at that as, you know, it was really designed for kind of mismanagement, not for a pandemic, but yeah. those are the rules you would, you, you agreed to when you took those bonds on. And so that injection of that cash helped us skirt through paying our debt service, helped us pay for our staff and keep people kind of moving down the line. And then we kind of kept moving. And by July of 2020, I'd kind of recognized that we can sit at home and we can kind of be frustrated, upset, and, and those types of things, or we can get people back to work. Yeah. And we had had lots of relationships with UNC Health System, Duke University, the medical professionals there, Wake County, Durham County, all these different agencies. And we were talking to them and said, there's got to be a safe way to get people back in our airport mm -hmm. and, and from an employee standpoint. And so we developed one way directional traffic, wearing a face mask, washing your hands. And in July of 2020, I brought everybody back home. Nice. Uh, and we put everybody to work. And as of today, knock on wood, we have not had one individual that's contracted COVID as a result of returning back to work, not one. But we put good protocols in place to make sure our employees were protected, make sure the passengers were protected. On top of that, uh, the Harvard School of Public Health did two different studies. One study was actually in the terminal. So you think about from the curb to the jet bridge. The other one was from the jet bridge to jet bridge, which is basically the airplane, yeah. getting on board the airplane. And what they concluded, it's just as safe to go to the grocery store as it was to fly on an airplane. 
And I think as we've done trace contacting throughout this country, it really hasn't, because of the protocols we put into place, you're not picking it up, not picking COVID up as a result of getting on board that airplane. What we are finding is what people do is, once they get out of the baggage claim, all those protocols we've been talking about, they forget about them. Yeah. And they go on vacation. And they think, well, I'm on vacation. And COVID doesn't go on vacation. COVID's everywhere. No, COVID doesn't go on vacation and it doesn't live in Atlanta. Just two places. Two uh, places yeah, it doesn't? Those are two places. Well, well Georgia, the whole know. state of Georgia, they don't have it. Ho they, ho they, they don't have it either? Perfect. <laughs> they got out of it early, you know? <laughs> they checked it out. <laughs> we are not going to have this. <laughs> so, yeah, well, so when you, you kind of look at that, and it was kind of, you know, a tough process to work through, but right. I think the team did a really nice job of responding, coming back, putting good protocols in place. You know, the, the, plexiglass to the signs, social distancing, all the things that airlines did in terms of their cleanliness, the HEPA filters they have on board the airplane, it works. It works very, very well. And so now we're just trying to work with our customers, our business customers, especially to get them comfortable. You can travel safely, and but you need to think about your final destination. Yeah. It's not so much the travel experience, it's once you get there, what are you going to do? And are you going to wear your face mask? Are you going to wash your hands, yeah. social distancing? If you do that, you can continue to operate. But you know, at the end of the day, we're social creatures. We have to be able to talk, visit, and see one another face to face. You can do a lot on Zoom, but you can't do everything. That's right. And I think uh, we'll eventually get back there. I, I do believe over time, we start thinking about the future, there's going to be some oscillations. And the oscillations, you know, it spiked really you know, strongly when we got to April, May time frame, it kind of fell back off and then spiked again. I think you'll continue to see that. I, I almost kind of look at the holiday cycle of, of this. And so, yeah. okay, so everybody had a nice summer, right? Guess what, summer's over. Not very many people feeling very good right now. And right. so hospitals are full. I think everybody will lock down again to some degree. And I think as we get back into Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and Christmas, Guess what? Everybody's going to travel again, go visit people. Right. And then January, February, nobody's going to feel very good again. And then spring break, we're all good again. You can see the cycle that we're running through is like, all of a sudden we feel like, well, we've got this thing licked and we feel like we can let our guard down. We're going to kind of go on vacation because we need to get away from it. And I get people need to get away from it, uh, but we're not getting away from this, I think, anytime soon. And we got to realize we're going to have to deal with it. And we've clearly demonstrated there is a way to do this, to yeah. continue your life moving and keeping us all moving, but all be safe vaccine is a very important component of that, I believe. I think you touched on something that's really, really important, human nature. Uh -huh. You know, when I go out and, and, and now that we're in a place where people are getting vaccinated and right. I see people that I haven't seen in a long time, we want to shake hands, we want to hug. I'm yes. Like, oh man, it's been so long. Oh, we're in a pandemic, I can't touch you, please don't touch me, step away. Yeah. You know, um, and, I, and I feel like in an airport, um, it may be harder to fight those types of those types of urges because people are seeing people they haven't seen in a long time. They're hugging. You know, I know that at the Starbucks, when you first come in, people used to stay, yep. stand out there and say their goodbyes or say their hellos. So have you observed any changes in human behavior in the airport in, in those regards? You know, it's from a business. It's funny when you watch people, they start with the hand. OK, they don't do the fist, no, yeah. they do the elbow and then it, they don't quite know what to do. But I will tell you, um, majority of the time, when I see people see their grandparents that they haven't seen in 18 months, yeah. the, their father and their mother, um, it's not a lot of fist bumping. It is, they go directly to the hug. They have to. Um, but, you know, most of them, they're doing the right thing by wearing the face mask, uh, and that has a tendency to protect people. It clearly has demonstrated that if you wear that, wash your hands, get the vaccine, you can keep yourself safe. So you, you work with all the, the airlines. Um, and I'm sure you've heard about a lot of different stories. Couple stories. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about just uh, managing that and, and kind of that behind the scenes experience? Because, you know, at one point we didn't really think about the airport or flying as being yeah. a political thing. Now, being next to someone is a political thing. You know, but but what has that been like just, just managing that on your perspective? Yeah, you, you think there was a transformation that occurred a couple years ago. Uh -huh. Uh, so if you think of the Trump administration, when they signed the executive order banning seven different countries for flying in this community, we had people show up on our doorstep said, hey, we, we'd like to express our dislike of that. Originally, it was going to be about 300 people they thought would show up. We had 1,500 people show up. Oh, wow. Yeah, on a front curb. And that really, for me, that was kind of the turning point of this kind of divide in this country. Yeah. I don't care what political party you're at, it's a divide. And, and I, I got to be honest with you, I would have thought 
in a period of time where we have a pandemic, we have a medical emergency, and all, all of our loved ones are in jeopardy, that is not the time to take partisan politics in place. Thank you. That's the time for us all kind of to come together and help each other out. This, right. is, this is hard. This is hard financially. This is hard mentally. This is hard socially. We ought to be coming together and not dividing ourselves. And you know, that's one thing great about the airport. We serve everybody. I don't care what your walk of life is, height, age, type of shoes you wear, we serve everybody. We want to be welcoming to everybody that comes to that facility. Mm -hmm. That's what our job is, and that's what our responsibilities are. And it was just kind of disheartening to me that we use this as a point to be kind of friction. And that politics, I think, has carried over on, on board the airplane. Yeah. Uh, unruly passengers, you've probably seen lots of the videos that have actually occurred. Uh, disheartening to see that, that is a very, dangerous situation to have in air. Airplanes aren't something you can just kind of, hey, it's like when you were growing up as a kid and your father said, stop horsing around back there, I'm gonna pull the car over. It's not like that. You can't just pull the car over uh, to get everybody yeah. under control. And so you got several minutes, so you're gonna be in air before you can get to the location, get on the ground, get it safely, and get additional resources on board to kind of get these things kind of neutralized. It's disappointing to see that. Um, the FAA has come out, also TSA, they're gonna get a lot more aggressive in terms of enforcement actions that are in that space. Um, but we're hoping that um, people take a momentary pause and recognize, hey, you're going on vacation. Yeah. You're going to see a loved one. This is a good thing. And you know, may not like the mask. There's lots of things in life I don't like. But think about others in today's environment. We need to be thinking about how we can help others and how you can help others and help them through it. Wear a mask. Best thing you can do to protect each other. You know, best thing you can do. I'm gonna say, I don't want another uh, airport CEO. Can we just have you forever? Because you making me feel safer. Just Yeah, honest. safer all day long. <laughs> well, y'all stay here as long as they want me to be here. I mean, yeah. again, I love being here. I love serving our community. I mean, it's a community asset. And again, we need to be open and welcoming to everybody that comes through our airport, no matter where you're from. I mean, that's what we should be doing. Well, and I, and I love the fact <laughs> that you, you, you're actually in the community. You know, you don't just go to work and go home. You actually get involved with what's going on out in the community. Uh, and that's an important uh, trait to have. How are we doing on time? 40 minutes. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just making sure. All right. So I want to talk to you about some of the things that you guys had to pivot on as an airport. Yeah. Uh, you all, you and I spoke a few days ago, and when we talked, I was surprised with the amount of innovations that you all have. And when I say innovations, I'm talking about process innovations, yeah. business innovations, the way that you want the airport to run. Uh, the the operator model was dope the the local aspect was dope like you i don't want to put it all out there i'll let you explain yeah, it but yeah can you talk about how you arrived to these new uh kind of ideas and, and, and the way that you want to implement it as well as kind of like where that's going yeah yeah so if you think about you know we have a crisis usually it forces you to change yeah. okay and in this particular case it did you think about our concessions so how we negotiate these deals with the concessions it's what they call a typical tenant landlord relationship right. you come to me and say hey i, I want to make hot dogs and i want to sell them at your airport and great if you're going to do that you have to pay me a minimum of five dollars every month in order to do that but all the investment for developing that that's all on you at the end of the day 100 percent your risk not my risk so if no passengers come through the front door, I don't guarantee that, you still owe me money. That is a traditional model. We went through pandemic and what happened is no income coming in and a lot of our small businesses, we do have some direct leases with some small companies, but a lot of those small companies are partnering with much larger companies and they're on the hook and they have literally leveraged their entire life. Their cars, their home, their children's education, all of it's on the line and there's really not much in terms of security that they've got other than customers got to come through the front door. Well, for 12 months, nobody's come through the front door. Right. How do you run a business? You can't. And so as we looked at that and started to say, we're starting to lose companies. They're saying, we're going to write this off. We're just literally going to walk away from this. You know, you can come after me. I said, we're not going to come after you. We've got losses as well. We'll both write it off and we'll walk away. But that capital that's needed to build the infrastructure, it is expensive to build at the airport. Somewhere between 600 to $800 a square foot is what it costs to build. It's very expensive. Wow. And so as a result, 
you know, companies, even larger companies, are starting to pick and choose where they're going to make those investments because they had the liquidity issue because they had to burn a lot of their cash to pay for their staff and keep their operations going. Not a lot of liquidity that's there for them to make the investment. So we decided to change the model a little bit. The model is what we call an operator agreement. So basically what we're seeking is operators, probably from our local community, that can run restaurants but we'll be the constructor or the contractor at the end of the day. If you think about it, that's what we do. Yeah. We build runways, we built that terminal, we build lots of stuff. We build billions of dollars worth of infrastructure. We can probably build a food court. We can probably build a retail piece. Tell me what you want, you know, operator, and we can build that. And it changes relationship because now I have my money invested into that yeah. and I'm looking for a true business partner. And as a small company, I don't have to outlay the cash from a capital standpoint. Mm -hmm. The model is very common over in Europe, not as common here in the United States. Probably only two other airports that are smaller than we are that have implemented this, but we're well on our way. We've done a community outreach to small disadvantaged businesses throughout our region to let them know what this new model looks like, that you actually have the ability to play at RDU and you don't have to partner with a large company, international company, that comes in and really sets very challenging terms and conditions that they're not in a position to negotiate. Yeah. Uh, and so much different relationship will develop. Plus, if you think about a region, what are we known for? Basketball, yes. Food, too. Foodie. A lot of foodies in our region, in Durham area and also in the Raleigh area. And so we can pull upon all those people to potentially find some relationships that we can have that make this place uh, a representation, the airport a representation of what you see in our local community. Right. Most people when they fly, when they come into the airport, they're really interested in terms of what is the food that kind of represents the region. <laughs> That's what they want to experience. You think of a farm bakery that came in there. We did that during uh, COVID and that relationship that we built. Local entrepreneur, you know, a baker, really has done phenomenal. Well received not only by the locals, but even people that are transitioning through. They just look at the lines that are going out the door. That's what we're looking for. And so better quality of service, uh, a relationship with our local community, relationship with our entrepreneurs that are in our local community, that's a new business model and we'll take the risk. So next time you run into a pandemic, I know how to weather a pandemic. I mean, we've shored it up and we actually put cash away during the pandemic yep. instead of losing cash. So we've been very smart about, you know, fighting our way through it. So that's one. Another one that the board just approved, you familiar with ghost kitchens? Yeah. So guess what? Board just approved ghost kitchen, a ghost kitchen of about eight different concepts in Terminal 2. And so these folks, you know, were limited staff, right? So waiters, waitresses, this concept is basically the chefs that are behind there with eight different brands, not the whole menu, but percentage of the high selling items on those menus that they will develop. And you can literally be standing in my checkpoint line about 90 days after they get up and running, yeah. that you can order what you want, walk down, pick it up and go to the gate or walk right on board the airplane. Awesome. Tremendous experience and you don't have to wait in line for anything. You can order at any point in time. We've got food lockers there that can either be heated or cooled. So another innovation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. let's back up for a yeah. second, Mike. Food lockers. Food lockers. What is that? So it's part of the ghost kitchen. So if you order your food and say, hey, I want a hot dog, well, we're gonna make sure it stays warm. So it's gonna be in this locker that you have the QR code for, punch your code in, open up, warm hot dogs, still ready to go. Want a cold beer? Yeah. Cold beer. You got a cold, cold container as well that you can kind of go to. So yeah, those are some cool. innovations that we came up with as a result of looking at the pandemic, seeing how these businesses were actually reacting and their ability to have access to capital was not there, that we needed to step in and provide that capital, but provide a business relationship and try to come up with innovative ideas. I'm not aware at this point of any other airport in the country that has started ghost kitchens. We may be the first. We'll see how the community accepts that, if they like that or not. We think that our employees will use it a lot. We think the airline crews will look a lot. We think our business customers will use it. And if it doesn't, it's an 18 month contract and we can say, okay, that concept didn't work. Let's come up with another idea, another innovative idea that we come up with at the end of the day. So constantly looking for ways to improve the experience, generate the bottom line, increase the bottom line for the airport authority, and hopefully come up with some creative concepts. This company is called Reef. Uh, Reef has got about 320 ghost kitchens all across the country. They do have a technology. We don't think we'll roll it out right away for a delivery service by kind of a robot. 
that if you're sitting at C23 and I just don't want to walk over to pick my food up, can I just deliver it to me? It could deliver right to you. So we're looking at maybe deploying that technology as well. That'd be, that be something cool. pretty cool. Yeah, that's kind that, of cool. Hey, you need to do work and get something done for your company. You can continue to work and they can deliver it right to you. I like that. Yeah, I, sit, yeah. I can sit at the little, because you used to have this little wine place at the airport that yes. you like to go to. I can sit there. Sit there and I'm hungry. Yep. Order some food. Food, maybe. wine, whatever you need. Oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. But if you think about Durham and the Durham community, very innovative. And so we're trying to replicate that a little bit. Probably not to the magnitude of what the great things are being created out of this community. Oh, but, yeah. hey, we're, we're doing a little bit to show that we're trying to be innovative yeah. and come up with creative ideas for our customers. Y'all are doing your thing. What else you got? You got anything else? Well, you know, if you think about parking, parking, we've got online reservation, license plate recognition. So... You can book online, put your license plate in there, make it a totally contactless experience. So you can roll up to the gate, it's got your license plate, we already know, you already pay, you drive in, you park your location, and you drive back out, don't have to roll your window down, we already have your credit card, and I see a nice little receipt and say, Tobias, thank you very much for parking at RDU, please come back. I can't go backwards. Can't go backwards, I, can After you? you tell me that, like, I can't <laughs> go back. It's just like, this is stuff that, that improves the overall quality of life, and on some level, I feel like, man, we should have been had that like that stuff yeah. makes so much sense i think the next piece in that parking is probably uh, some wayfinding capability where you could literally look down our lanes and have green light red light type yeah. technology so you know because we have spaces open but you got to drive around a lot and that's a waste of customers time yeah. but it is a significant investment in, in 2020 we were probably about 10 minutes away from making about a five million dollar investment to get that done but pandemic hit, and yeah. so we just it just imploded upon ourselves. But my guess, next 12 months, we'll probably you know bring that back online, put it in place again. Anything we do to save you time as a customer, we want to be able to do that. Better experience, book it online. You're going to save 20% if you book online. Yeah. So book online, save, and that way you're also guaranteed that even if we sell out the deck, we're going to make sure that there's still a stall there for you that you can actually park at the end of the day. Yeah. So all good stuff. This is. That's incredible. Yeah. What else do we have for the future? We're going into the future now. You got some stuff that you're rolling out now, and you just talked about the parking like that's yeah. coming in the future. What can you tell me? Because I know you got some stuff you can't even let me know about it's right now. It's all classified. Yeah, it's right? all it's classified. All classified. <laughs> yeah. but I'll what? whisper a couple of things to you. But. Okay, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we're going to do that later after I get some alcohol in your system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about um, like what's next for the airport. What, what else yeah. is coming? Because you've weathered this pandemic you're still weathering it yeah but there are some things that you've pulled out that i feel like are just going to become a part of the dna like you're going to expect it when you come to rdu airport what else do you have that you can tell me about that's coming down the pipeline yeah so i, I think you'll see us spend a lot of time trying to develop infrastructure so first of all our longest runway we'll call five left two three right standard terminal two you look out that's a ten thousand foot piece of pavement uh, okay. It's really kind of reaching its end of life. And we're having to do some surgical repairs, some slab replacements. We were talking with the FAA today. Mm -hmm. If you think about this, uh, when we were doing slab replacements, when the London and Paris flight were taking off, as soon as those went wheels up and the wheel well were flying over across the pond, we were saw cutting out 25 by 25 slabs, shoring it back up, rebar, pouring concrete. Planes were already back flying in the air, coming back across the pond. The Atlantic Ocean coming back across the pond while that was forming up just in time so when that airplane was ready to land they were landing on that runway oh my god yeah yeah we did that 200 times zero problems whatsoever by doing that that's no way to run an airport and it's something we've been talking to the FAA about that when your listeners are listening to continue to advocate for us at the federal level that they need to be making an investment in our airport to help us place through a runway. So we're in the process of going through an environmental process. You'll see us build a new runway. We're gonna build about 500 feet out. When we do that, it's gonna open up the opportunity to build 19 additional gates uh, at T2. Uh, you'll see us trying to come up with a solution for our rental car facilities. Mm -hmm. Rental car facilities are probably, they should have been replaced probably five years ago. Yeah. We are working towards that. Don't know if we'll build a large, what we call a Conrec facility. Put everybody consolidate in a rental. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if we'll do that at Terminal or maybe, maybe some sort of hybrid of that. Yeah. Trying to get people from having to bust them all over the place. You'll see us redevelop our ground transportation access to the facility. So you take an Uber or Lyft, you might see us consolidate that all to where the premier parking is to have a ground transportation center to free up our curbs. I've seen that at some airports yep. too. Yeah. The Detroits of the world, they do a lot of that type of activity. 
if you think about our curbs in 2019, especially during the summer, late at night, it was stacked up past Terminal 1 from Terminal 2. So we're trying to do a better job from a ground transportation standpoint. I, my vision uh, would be to try to figure out how we redevelop where the current rental car facilities are. It's probably 10 years and beyond, but I like to put a nice hotel there, conference center there, food, beverage, and retail there, something that people, while you're waiting, you can experience. You, you know, you got a, attorneys that fly in or businesses that fly in, they can be right there. If you got a six o'clock in the morning flight and I got to get it from Durham to get down there and I got to get there two hours before, yeah. I'll just take a hotel room right across from the airport. So you can see us developing that as well yeah. uh, as we move forward. So there's a lot uh, in terms of infrastructure you're going to see us to do. And you'll see us continue to look for food, beverage, and retail concepts that matter to our customers, trying to figure out how we uh, integrate technology. Um, we have looked at what we call an e-commerce platform. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but if you think about e-commerce, you use a phone for everything, right? So you want to book your parking, you go to one location. You want to buy your food, one location. All of it integrated into this e-commerce platform just like in Amazon, but at the airport. We have done a lot of research and I think that we're close, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, but over time, as we add these additional services, it should be available on a platform to make it easy for you to pick and choose what you want. Hopefully maybe sometime in the future, you wanna get your car washed, you wanna get your laundry done. All those are additional services that we can start adding into the mix, provide the experience to do what? Improve your time. So when you're traveling, we're doing your laundry. So you don't have to do that when you get home. So when you're home, Enjoy the kids, enjoy the family, enjoy the outside. Go do something fun. We want to you know, make your time more valuable once you get home. That Y'all are amazing. Um, one request. One request? One request, though. Uh, I saw that in Asia, they got these little places where you can go and sleep in the airport. Yes. Little cubbies. So, yes. Yeah, we all decided to get one of those? That. Yeah, I want one. Just one. Just Me. one? We don't need it for everyone else. Just for when I come to the airport. For you come to the airport? Yeah, yeah just, just do that. <laughs> um, no, so so what I what I wanted to say was the work that y'all are doing, you and your team, mm -hmm. y'all are amazing, and I know you probably don't hear that from people because y'all are always in the offices trying to make things happen. Right. But I just want you to know that I appreciate everything y'all are doing. We appreciate um, that. I just picked up a guest from the airport Monday. Okay. And uh, Sky Zoo, and so uh, picked him up, and that was my first time at the airport in a while. Was it? I'm gonna tell you how long it had been. I passed the exit. You passed the exit. I didn't know that the exit wasn't an exit anymore. So it used to be that you'd get off of that exit, the airport road exit, it, you know, take you around. Yeah. That's gone. So yeah. I didn't know that. But the interesting thing about it was um, the day before, I think it was the day before, I drove out that way and I was just thinking, this is a beautiful ride. I went down to 540 and I came up past the pond. Yep. And I was just like, yo. I don't think I'm ever going to bring anyone like back to Durham the other way anymore. I think we're just going to have to come down past yeah. the pond, but it is just beautiful. Yeah, so. you'll see two of the interchange we've got. One is by Sheets. The other one is kind of the primary entrance. Yeah. DOT is redoing both of those intersections, so they'll beautify that and pick that up along with the, making it easier to get into the airport, kind of nice. building for the future capacity needs nice. uh, the airport as well. So, no, it should be good. Well, it looks, it looks good already, well, and good. I, can see, I can see the vision just in things starting yeah. to, to come up and everything. So you, go, you guys are doing an incredible job. I appreciate that. Thank you. We uh, got a good, good group of people that work there on a day-to-day -day basis. You do. I know a few of them. I know a yeah. few of your board members. I don't know if Patrick still sits on your board. He is still uh, chair. He's yeah. a chair now. Yeah, chair. Oh, come on, Patrick. Yeah. Hannah. You got to get the chair in here. I have a conversation we with We got to talk to Patrick. I got to get up with Patrick anyway. It's been yeah. so long. Uh, but, but it's an amazing job that y'all are doing. So I know we're, we're getting short on time. Yep. Uh, and I can see uh, Chris over here nodding his head as soon as I said that. Yeah, you know, yeah. short. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mike, Mike, is there anything you want to you want to announce any anything coming up that you want to put out there to the world? You want the world to know uh, we'll probably be out around, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas yeah. time. So, you know, I don't know if I have any announcement, probably more than anything. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all the people of this local community. I, I can't tell you the outpouring of support that we have received from our local community, from the health professionals that every single time we called and we said, you know, what do you do? They were Johnny on the spot. They would help us if we had challenges with our employees. I mean, how do you handle an employee that may have COVID? They were there all the times. We also have what we call a carry on campaign. We had multiple businesses all came together and they invested their own money to develop an advertising campaign and a social media campaign about encouraging people that it is safe still to travel. And that was investments by private companies. Yeah. So we received support from them and all the support we received from the general public.
uh, of just thanking our people and uh, just being appreciative of what we actually provide at the end of the day, it's been great. And it's one of the reasons why I like working here is because the people, yeah. the people of this region are good people. They're very good people. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. We appreciate it. It has been a very difficult road financially, physically, mentally for all of our team. Uh, but they love it when they stand there at the checkpoint and they see somebody walk out and they hug their mother, they hug their grandmother, they get to see their family or friends, or they see sports teams coming in. That's what makes it all worth it on a day-to-day -day basis is we, you know, we impact people's lives. Y'all are so cool. Yeah. Mike, thank you so much. And, Anytime. You know, I wanted to say, yeah, we got good people here in Durham, but you serve the whole region. And you're right. We've got good people all over. And I, I'm in the same mindset. I love working here in Durham. I love working, you know, even with people in Raleigh. It's just something different, I feel, uh, with the way that people treat each other. You talked about the diversity. There's a lot of diversity in thought. Uh, I used to go out to the bars before the pandemic started and I would like to go to the bars and just talk to people yeah. and you would get out there and you don't know it, but you're talking to a Nobel prize winning person who just, you're talking to about drinks right now. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff has happened before. And so it's just fascinating to be in this community with, with so many smart people, so many interesting people and people who are willing to, to, to band together to do things like run this campaign. Yeah, and incredible things going. in our community. Thank you. Great Thank universities, you. RTP. Yep. I mean, it's just incredible. A lot of smart people all coming together to make this all work as a community and a great place, great place to live. That's really great right. place. Well, Mike, thank you so much. Sure. I appreciate you coming out. And uh, for everybody else, I'll go ahead and wrap this up, I guess, because it's that time. <laughs> but uh, for everybody else, thank you so much for, for watching us and, and checking us out. And, uh, you know, this this is an amazing. Like, you got some stories. We got to sit yeah. down and for real talk talk because uh, you got some. some we got bar some, stories. Yeah. Too, so we have to go to the bar next. We got to do that. We <laughs> That's way overdue. We got to do that. So uh, so for everyone, please subscribe, follow, like, uh, download. Get into the comment section. I want to hear what you think. I want to know what you're thinking about what we're talking about. I want to hear what's on your brain. For all you trolls, I've said this before, please don't, don't even comment. If you do, I'm going to block you. I'm going to ignore it. I don't care about you. <laughs> don't. I don't care about your trolls. But everyone else will love you. Um, so please, like, follow, subscribe. Tell your friends about it. And uh, check us out next time. But you've been locked into conversations. Like, my man, Mike Lang of CEO of the RDU airport right here with me, killing it, giving us stories all day long. Not all day long. We're done. We're not going to keep doing this. But again, thank you. And thank you all for joining in. I'm going to holler at y'all later. Peace.